Hello and welcome to Unraveling the Secrets. This is a special edition of Unraveling the Secrets because we're actually recording uh, in the suburbs of Geneva in Switzerland. Um, we've got the wonderful opportunity and I'm taking this wonderful opportunity to interview somebody that has been a great influence on my work uh, for at least, I would say, eight or nine years. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Arthur Funkhauser, also known as Art. Um, I came across Art's work probably in about 2001 when doing a search on the déjà vu phenomenon I came across a paper called The Dream Theory of Déjà Vu. This fascinated me so much that I contacted Art and asked for his advice uh, on where I should go in terms of déjà vu and my research in that area and he was a profound help. Um, Art is now um, uh, a major member of my international forum and is recognised by most people as being probably one of the world's experts on, on the déjà phenomenon. So firstly I'd just like to thank Art very much for joining us today. Uh, he's travelled over from Bern especially um, and we're also having a, an interesting meeting tonight evaluating some other interesting um, software and some interesting hardware that we'll be, I'll be telling you about in due course. Now what I'd like to do is firstly is just have um, Dr. Von Kauser explain a little bit about his background because unusually in this area Art is actually a, a physicist as well and what I'd like to do is for him to explain a little bit about his background and then we'll get talking about déjà vu generally. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I have my first degree was in physics at MIT in Boston back in 1962 uh, worked for a time as a physicist for the Bureau of Standards in the United States. Uh, but I had in the back of my mind also the memories of some very outstanding deja vu experiences that I'd had as a teenager. And these would not leave me alone. Then I discovered that actually I would be much better working with people than working with lasers. And uh, I decided to do a training at the Jung Institute in Zurich, uh, which I did. That's what brought me to Switzerland. And since that time, I've been seeing clients uh, and been working with dreams. In my deja vu experiences, for me, they were very clearly connected with dreams. And maybe my interest in working with dreams with people stems from those experiences that I had back then. Uh, I did my diploma work on déjà vu, uh, and everything I've done since then has grown from that. What else do I need to tell you? I think that I think it would be interesting because your your papers and the ones that I've actually read, one or two of the the, the, the déjà experiences you had when you were a young man, I always found quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about those experiences and what? were interesting and what stimulated your ideas that these were actually some form of remembering dreams? Okay, I, I have two that have stayed in my mind ever since they happened. Uh, I can relate them. The first one occurred when a bunch of boys from our neighborhood decided to invent a new game. And in this game we would uh, play hide and seek on bicycle. And so one of us went off to hide on his bicycle and we waited and then we fanned out through the neighborhood looking for him. It didn't take long though before we discovered that this was not a good idea. The neighborhood was far too large, there were far too many places one could hide. And so we gave up. And a bunch of us were riding on our bicycles back towards the direction of where I lived at the time. And suddenly I knew this experience. I knew that I was on this bicycle with these others. And that very shortly we would be taking a turn. And down at the end of that street would be the house where I lived. And this fellow that we were looking for would be in the lawn of my house laying his bicycle down. And I, I knew that that's what was going to happen, and by George, it did. That's exactly what happened. And it was amazing because while I knew this, there was a part of me that wanted to tell the others, hey, I know where he is, I know we're going to find him. But I couldn't do that because that was not 
part of what I knew was going to happen. People have asked me, well, why don't you take notes? Well, you can't take notes because that's not included in what was going to happen. And you don't want to break it. It's so fascinating, so mind-blowing, that you don't want to stop it. You want to see how long this will go. So that was the one experience. And I want to emphasize here that we'd never played that game before that, and we never played that game after that. That was the only time that, that we ever did that. And still I had that experience. The other one that I uh, always think about happened when I was playing ping pong. I discovered I had, maybe because of the tennis that I had learned, I had somewhat of a talent for it. And another schoolmate and I would practice after school. And for a long time we had the school gymnasium to ourselves. We could put the table in the middle of the basketball court and practice as long as we wanted to. But at one point the coach came and he said, lads, you're going to have to find another place to play. We need the court for basketball practice. And so this other fellow and I went searching around and we located a table in a student union building at a nearby college. And so we started playing there. Now this room had about maybe three feet, that's a meter, behind the table at both ends. It was very cramped for us. But we still played there and it wasn't long before college students discovered that two high school students had come into their student union and we were being challenged right and left for a time. And one day while I was playing there, uh, suddenly I recognized this place and these people. And then I remembered that I had dreamt this, but at the time that I dreamt this event, which was some months previous, way before we knew about this room or this table, the part of me that was watching the dream was very, very curious as to where is this? What kind of strange table is this? Because it was blue and had all kinds of nicks in it, which no table I had seen before was like, was like that. And also I was asking, who are these people? Then when this came true, then I knew. I said, oh, oh, this is the place. Oh, these are these people now. Now I know them. In the previous experience with the bicycle uh, hide and seek, I also knew that I had dreamt that in advance. I couldn't have told you how, many, how far in advance, but I knew that that had also come from a dream. And these experiences intrigued me, but I didn't know how to talk about them. The term deja vu was not something that I had ever heard of. And when I went to people and said, I'm having these strange experiences, they just shrugged their shoulders or looked at me sort of strangely and they didn't know what I was talking about. So very quickly I learned this is not something you can talk about. And it was only much later that I discovered these are called deja vu experiences. How did you find, how did you then find out about the term deja vu as such? How did you come across it? I was working uh, at that time in the Washington DC area, just outside Washington, and uh, was passing the National Institute of Health uh, in my car and said, I'll bet they have a library, I'll bet if anybody in this world has information about these kinds of experiences, they might be the people. So I stopped in and I went into the, I found the library and I went in and I went to the library and I said, I'm interested in finding out information about some very intriguing experiences that I've had. And I started describing them and he, he said, oh, you're talking about deja vu. And that opened up a whole new world for me. Suddenly I discovered, oh, other people are having these experiences too. <laughs> In terms of statistics, because one of the, the articles that fascinated me, one of the ones you wrote, was about the, the statistical incidence of, of the Deja experience in the general public. 
And I was quite surprised to discover from the, the statistics you give that it's surprisingly common, isn't it? Well, it all depends on how you define it. But if you define it rather vaguely, then you arrive at a, a incidence of maybe 65, 64 to 65% in the general American adult population in the various surveys that have been done. If you uh, ask college students, then the incidence is even higher. It's up in 79 to 80% of college students say they've had these experiences. Do you think there is a, a reason for that? Is there any kind of idea as to why that would be? One of the few things that we know about uh, Deja experience is that it seems to be correlated with intelligence. It can also be that young people are more free to talk about such experiences than older people. It can also be that if these happen more frequently when you are young, which is one of the other things that we know about them, that you'll be more likely to remember the experiences when you're in younger years. Because that's intriguing, because I've heard that, that the older you get, the less you're likely to have deja vu experiences. Less likely, less frequently, and less intense. There is one argument I know that they suggest that the reason why deja experiences decrease as you get older is that the, the, are, the, the things that are strange and unusual in your life become less. But of course that's almost a counter-argument, isn't it? Because the more experience as I have in my life, surely there are more chances for me to associate what I see with the things I've experienced in my past. Right. So in which case that actually runs counter, that whole argument runs counter, doesn't it? Yes, right. Ways. Well, there's this theory that, that deja vu experiences are evoked by something similar mm. that surprises you and then you suddenly have a, uh, what would you call it, a, a, an experience that fills in the, the blanks and say, oh, I know this. And uh, because of just something that, that triggers it. That, and that may in fact happen uh, to people, but that's very different from what I experienced and what others have experienced. Yes, I'd agree. I mean, when I have a, a deja experience, it's, it's more than that. It's, it, 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 you almost have this kind of peculiar sensation of strangeness and oddness as well that seems to permeate the, the overall experience. Now, one of, the, um, one of the areas that I'd like to discuss now is, is the feigned Ephron explanation for deja or the deja experience. So, Art, if you'd like to explain to the guys out there a little bit about exactly what Robert Ephron stated and, and how that has developed in recent years in terms of recent developments in neurology and such like. Uh, it's been a long time since I've read the Ephron paper. <laughs> What I remember about it is that he, uh, in a sense, reinvented a concept that uh, uh, Arthur Wigan in 1845 came up with, that there is a possible delay that happens between the two brain hemispheres. And uh, so one brain hemisphere has perceived a scene or uh, incident and the for some reason the other brain hemisphere is a bit delayed in perceiving it and when the, when the message gets across over the callus callosum from the one hemisphere to the other the other hemisphere says yes I already know that I've already seen this and that evokes this sense of familiarity which which people have and as you know Tony I I'm saying at this point we don't know enough to exclude any of these experiences that that could well be a, an experience for some types of deja experience it's just not the, ex the explanation for all of them i think that's the issue isn't it that in many ways what we're doing is we're lumping together many many different sensations and experiences some of which are are clearly precognitive some of others are all to do with the recognition and such like. Mm -hmm. And I was aware of recent research that's been done by somebody called Akira O'Connor at um, the University of Leeds, who's part of the, the Chris Moulon team. Mm -hmm. And what 
I think it's I think it's a he. I think it's male. Mm -hmm. uh, for initially, I thought Akira probably with the A ending probably was female, but being potentially a Japanese name, it's probably male. So we stand corrected as to, to whether <laughs> whatever sex this 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 person is. But they've done some Akira. If you're out there, yes. let us know. Let please. us know, please. <laughs> yes, we are intrigued on that one. <laughs> yeah. um, and the as as I understand it, what O'Connor had said was that. Although the way the neural pathways run from the eyes, effectively it would mean that there could possibly be a delay across the corpus callosum as the message comes across. Whereas it has been found that people who are born blind still have um, deja senti experiences where they actually have a, a hearing deja vu, where they recognize what they are hearing and then suddenly the hearing then happens in reality. And I'm informed that the way in which the, the neural pathways for hearing work is that there isn't that kind of delay, it's not possible. No. So in which case, the, the Ephron thesis is at least off the board in terms of an explanation for some, if not most, deja experiences. But if you speak to most people who try to denigrate and explain the experience, you will still find that they will still cite the Ephron experience and say, this is the correct way of looking at it, then it doesn't seem to be the case. But I know from art's work that art has expanded out the whole idea of the, 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 the general term of presentiment and, and déjà vu. It's a much wider thing than that, isn't it? You have many, many definitions of the déjà experience and different types. And I know that in terms of your work with uh, Vernon Nepp, which we'll be talking about. Is it Vernon Nepp or Nepp? Nepp, Nepp uh, as far as I know. All right, which we'll touch on later. But if you'd like to explain to the people out there the, the different types of deja vu experiences they can have so they can use it quite precisely when they describe it in the future. Okay, uh, thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> I uh, have decided that we can talk about four categories of deja experience. And by the way, the term deja experience was coined by Vernon Nepe, and I want to make sure that he's credited with that. Uh, the first type one would call ordinary or common deja vu, and these, or deja experiences, and these tend to be very fleeting, very, very short. They are not associated with any kind of uh, other symptoms, like headache or nausea, and they have no precognitive aspect. Uh, and these ones could well be explained by some kind of glitch uh, happening in the brain um, or the matrix. Uh, there is another kind of deja experience though which is associated with pathological uh, symptoms like nausea and these are the kinds of deja experience that are either associated with schizophrenia or with epilepsy. And I think it's, we can be justified in saying this is a separate kind of deja experience, a, de a separate category, if you will. Uh, people who have uh, experimented with drugs, some of them have also said that they've uh, caused deja experiences that way. And one can argue as to whether that's pathological or not. There's a third category, and that's what I would call the parapsychological category. In, the, in these, you actually have uh, precognitive knowledge. You know what's going to happen before it does. And uh, some of these can go longer, where you know exactly what's going to happen, and then it all just takes place the way that you know it's going to. Uh, and this can be very unsettling because in our current world and life view, we don't have theories for explaining those kinds of things. Uh, then there's a fourth category, and I call that evoked. Uh, these are deja experiences which one can uh, create in the laboratory with hypnosis. I know that the Moulin Group in Leeds has been experimenting with this. Uh, a fellow named Penfield was evoking experiences which he said were similar to Deja experience with electrodes uh, probing it on the temporal lobe of the brain. And again, 
ones that are caused by drugs, you could say, well, those are evoked. Uh, I guess the, the question here is intention. Is it intentionally caused or do they happen by accident? Uh, of the parapsychological types of deja experience, I like to differentiate between what I call deja vecu. Actually, I'm not the first to use these terms. They've been known for a long time which means already experienced, already lived through. And this is situational. First this happens, and then that happens, and then that happens, the way you know they're going to happen. And so time plays a definite role. But then there's another kind of deja experience where time doesn't play <coughs> such an important role, and that's <coughs> what we call deja visite already visited, already been there. And in these experiences, people go to a place that they know they've never been to before, but they recognize it. Or they go to a town and they know their way around this town, even though they know they've never been there, could not possibly have been there, maybe on a different continent even. Or go to a house and they know what's inside the house, even though they've never been to this house before. And this one we call deja visite. There's a th <clears throat> third form which I've called deja senti, which means I've already felt this way before. Uh, this might be something that a person with epilepsy might experience, of uh, being in a, a similar feeling state that they recognize. Whether that's parapsychological or not, I. I I'm not quite sure. But those are, those are the categories that I've worked out up till now, but I think it's important that we just talk about deja experiences and, and just leave away the term deja vu because it's so vague. We don't, we don't know really what that means anymore. <laughs> well, that's it, isn't it? Because people, you know, that the, the, there are so many differences. And I've found that on my forum we have a section on on the deja vu experience because we call it deja vu because that's what people call it that's and Art Kindly is the guy that runs that for me so if any of you guys out there have had peculiar or unusual deja sensations particularly precognitive ones that other people have witnessed we'd be really keen for you to to contribute on there now also I'll give Art also the opportunity to tell you guys a little bit about a survey he's been doing as well, which you can, I think it's still available, isn't yes, it? Yes, it's still online. To be online and, and put those information as well. But before we move on to that, what I'd just like to do is to give, to give you the opportunity or for Art to explain his particular dream theory of, uh, of deja vu, which I found absolutely beguiling when I first came across it. And that's indeed why I first contacted him because it makes so much sense. And whenever I mention this to people, you can see, even last night when we were actually having a, when we were out on dinner, I mentioned that mm -hmm. to, uh, to Engelbert Winkler, Dr. Winkler, who is the guy that we're, we're meeting with this, this weekend. And he nodded in approval and he said, no, that's exactly my deja sensations. They are dreams. Mm. So I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your, your, your ideas and theories there, and also a little bit about the, the background to those ideas, you know, so the writings of, of people like Dunn and people and, and such like, and Priestley. Yes, well, we're talking in the area of precognition and precognitive dreams. And uh, you've mentioned Dunn. Uh, Dunn was an aeronautical engineer in England, uh, designed airplanes that were used in the First World War, but he also had precognitive dreams, which he found very remarkable, and his take on it was actually, if you look at your dreams closely, you will often find elements which are from the future. And he wanted to prove this. He even did a survey, I think at Cambridge, Oxford, Cambridge, one of the big universities in the UK, uh, to see if he could prove uh, this, gathering dreams from the students and so on. And this is all written up in his book, uh, which came out in 1927, I think it was, called Experiment with Time. Uh, and it's been reissued in subsequent editions. 
And this was a pioneering work uh, in this whole field of precognition, especially when in connection with dreams. Uh, J.B. Priestley uh, wrote a book later on called Man and Time. He devotes a whole chapter to uh, Dunn and his work. And uh, was also very fascinated with this whole aspect of time and knowing in advance of what might happen. Uh, and incorporated this theme in some of the plays that, that uh, he wrote. In my case, I had precognitive dreams, and the difference between the deja experience that's been evoked by a dream and what we call a precognitive dream is a precognitive dream, and this is just terminology, we're splitting hairs here. A precognitive dream is one that you remember before it comes true. In a deja experience, you do not remember the dream until it starts coming true, and then you say, oh, I dreamt this. Then there are premonitions and uh, hunches and intuitions, and I suspect there's a large amount of overlap between these various forms of uh, knowledge of what's going to happen before it does. We don't have yet a good explanation of how this can be, but people are working on it. Tony has met a physicist in the U.S. who's right on the cutting edge of this kind of research. And I'm going to quiz him about that meeting as soon as we're finished with this interview. <laughs> um, there are other kinds of... Uh, well, let me say, we've created the term deja rev, which means already dreamt, for this kind of deja experience. But there's a problem with this, and I'm not happy with this designation at all. Because you can also have the experience, which I'm sure many of you have had, of while you're dreaming, you say, oh, I've had this dream before. Uh, what's called a recurring dream. Well, that would also be a deja rev. And others have had dreams in which they say, oh, I'm back at this place where I was, where I've had an ad another dream. That would also be deja rev. So we're at this point where we're, we really do not have a good terminology and we have to keep on working with that. So there are three kinds of Deja Rev theories, and I have to say, well, I'm talking about the Deja experience kind of Deja Rev, and that's the best I can do at this point. If you get into the literature, you will find that there are lots of people who are, have written extensively about precognitive dreams. You have in England the Society of Psychical Research, which have been around since 18-whatever, yeah, and has very prominent British scientists as the founding members. And if you read through the reports that have been sent in, you'll find that uh, precognitive dreams are very prominent there. And they've been with us for, for all this time, and yet we're still still just in the very beginning of learning about what this possibly can tell us about the reality that we live in. Tony, by the way, is at the forefront of this too. <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> yes. it's one of the, the fascinating things, because the, the implication is that if, if a, 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 you, could, you have a precognitive dream, you are effectively seeing the future. And the question is, within the present model of physics, the idea of being able to see something that has yet to take place is absolutely impossible. So the question is, what exactly is happening when an individual sees a future event? Now, could it be a future memory in the sense that they are remembering that they have either lived this life before or they've experienced this time before? Or is there something more to this? Is it a way in which the human mind can access information that, is, that is, has been collected almost by other people? You know, and it's one of the areas in my next book that I'll be dealing with, the idea.